I started this way this morning, but because we weren't all here, I want to remind us again this afternoon that um, I want that we are on the ceded lands of the Nez Perce tribe and the traditional homelands of the Palouse Band of Indians, and we acknowledge their ongoing connections to land, the water, and their ancestors. Um, so I want to hand it over to um, Jeff Sanders, who's an associate professor in the history department. Um, and every year, this symposium begins with a faculty member who comes to us with an idea. <laughs> and Jeff had that idea this semester, uh, this year, and he said he wanted to do something about land and landscape and digital practices, and he wasn't sure what, what exactly that was. And so we all did a lot of brainstorming and came up with this idea. And so I think it's, um, Jeff's going to kind of kick off the second half of this program and introduce our next speakers. So thank you, Jeff. All right, thanks for coming, you guys, for the second half. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rupika Rissam. Uh, Dr. Rissam is an assistant professor of English at Salem State University in Massachusetts, where she is also the coordinator of the Digital Studies Graduate Program and coordinator of the Secondary English Education Program. Her research interests include post-colonial African American and US ethnic studies, as well as the role of the digital humanities in these areas. Uh, Rissam is the author of New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities in Theory, Practice, and Pedagogy. This sounds really interesting. I need to read it immediately. Uh, she's also co-editor of Debates in the Digital Black Atlantic for the debates in the Digital Humanities series. Uh, her many digital projects include the Harlem Shadows Project, Visualizing Du Bois, and Digital Salem. The title of her presentation today is Mapping Migration Beyond the Migrant Problem. Please welcome Dr. Rupika Rissam. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I'm a settler scholar here. I appreciate the opportunity to be a guest. Um, I want to thank Kim, uh, Kristen, for inviting me to be here. It's a particular honor because your work has been so influential for mine. Um, thank you as well to, to William uh, for Clements for arranging my visit and my fellow speakers. I've already learned so much from you um, this morning. Uh, today I'm going to discuss how data visualizations of European asylum seekers and refugees are in danger of positioning migrants as a problem and some approaches that resist that inscription. Uh, this is a topic I've come to as a migrant myself. Uh, my family is from Kashmir, which is the disputed territory between India and Pakistan. So if you've been following the news, it hasn't been a very great week. Um, but it's a poignant time to be talking about land and place and, and migration um, because the militancy and insurgency in Kashmir, particularly in the late 80s and 90s, has uh, indelibly shaped my life and the life of my family, uh, both for those of us, uh, for my family members who stayed there and those of us who migrated um, first to uh, England and then to the United States. Um, and to recognize that this experience um, of migration to the U.S. is simultaneously marked by um, complicity and in, 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 um, is facilitated by being a seller, um, while at the same time marked by the othering of being a migrant. Um, but recognizing that uh, I'm able to be in the United States and do the work that I do um, because of the um, treatment of Native First Nation and Indigenous communities in the United States. Um, in the vein of, the, of as I said, the, um, of the othering of the migrant, uh, public discourse in the global north frequently figures the migrant as a problem. Uh, so we've seen that in claims for our, uh, Brexit. We've seen that in Donald Trump's invectives against uh, immigration. Uh, and the migrant becomes a repository of fears and anxieties and racism of dominant cultures that are threatened by another. And this narrative is compounded by its reproduction, circulation, and amplification in media and mass communication. Uh, in particular, the deployment of textual, visual, and uh, gestural cues uh, within data visualizations of migrations um, are what I want to focus on today and to think about how they're producing powerful arguments about migration. Uh, and particularly are at risk of dehumanizing migrants and positioning them as others and as a problem. 
So innovations in data visualization have facilitated the process of making meaning out of uh, large data sets. And access to new tools and digital platforms that facilitate the mapping of data, even for novice users, along with the increasing availability of data sets that can be used for these purposes, has been heralded with great enthusiasm, uh, both by academic and public audiences. So you may be familiar with um, Andrew Kahn's visualization um, of the Atlantic slave trade, which I'll start picking up in a few seconds. Uh, the Atlantic slave trade in two minutes, which is created by Slate, uh, went viral and uh, continues to be regularly reshared on a daily basis. And this is using data from the um, uh, Voyages Transatlantic Slave Trade uh, database. Um, what sometimes gets lost in the excitement over these visualizations uh, is attention to the ways that they are representations, and as such, they're making arguments about the world and about people. Uh, and as representations, they are no less imbued with power and politics or cultural norms than other texts. And there are some several really obvious ways where this uh, sense of them being um, arguments and representations comes into play. One is in the data uh, that's used. Um, and in the maps as well. Um, certainly there are critical dimensions of this data, who's collecting it, for what purposes, using what kinds of terms, with what goals in mind, um, and how those term that terminology influences the data that's collected. And maps have been long intertwined with political power, uh, both in national and international contexts. Uh, and the act of map making is at once an exercise in world ma making because maps not only construct uh, the world but the ways in which we know the world. So cartography has been implicated in the legitimation of the state, um, of land, authority, uh, and belonging. And the same, I argue, actually holds true for geospatial data visualizations of migration. When visualizations are designed to represent human migration, whether this movement is free or by force, we must attend to both the tensions in the maps and the data that are inevitable in these data visualizations and the ethical dimensions of representing vulnerable communities. We must consider the explicit and implicit rhetorical moves that such visualizations are laying bare um, to interrogate their ideological positioning and their discursive contributions as a mediated form of com communication uh, particularly in relation to public conversations around migration. And then we also must consider alternative practices that resist the inscription of migrants as a problem. So what kind of claims uh, do maps make about migration? The case of migrations map, which you can see here, um, visualizes global migration by country without distinctions about the circumstances of migrant populations. Uh, and it's a useful example for understanding the broader uh, challenges of migration visualizations, which only get more complex when we move on to maps involving um, asylum seekers and refugees. Users of migration maps, so I should note, uh, since maybe about a month ago, they, this is now, uh, the site is now passworded. I'm not entirely sure why, so this is a screenshot. Um, users of the map used to be able to select a country, uh, see arrivals and departures by numbers, um, and human movement on this map is depicted through lines between countries of origin and destinations, while numbers are reported in a table on the left where color codes indicate quantity per country. The data for migrations map and this data, their data set was last updated in 2007, uh, is drawn from the Global Migrant Origin Database. Uh, and while this visualization seems to indicate ongoing movement through curved lines and numerical data, uh, the data is actually a disaggregation of migrant stock based on population censuses from uh, the year 2000. Uh, it actually looks like it's something that it's not, in a sense. Um, human migration is a complicated phenomenon though, with some migrants uh, moving by choice and some not, some being welcomed, others are not, some deciding where they're going and some do not. Uh, and these complications are all obscured in this particular project. 
Uh, you can see that there are visual dimensions of the platform and textual cues that orient users towards a focus on arrivals and departures. And to the core questions uh, in the upper right-hand corner, where are migrants coming from? Where have migrants left? Um, seeming to imply a flow or a movement, that's actually not the case. It's really the story of relationships between birthplace and citizenship um, at, in a population at one point in time. Uh, so the example here illustrates some of the presumptions uh, that are lay behind the task of mapping migration, um, and especially that migration can be rendered neatly, numerically, and visually. Uh, these presumptions are all the more crucial for representations of uh, asylum seekers, refugees, and forced migrants. Uh, as migration's map shows, when visualizing human migration, the movement of people, free or forced, is at odds with static depictions of national borders. Representing migration data requires rhetorical moves that are at odds with standard maps as users know them. Uh, this is particularly important because maps are often understood by users as being objective and scientific, as an exact representation, uh, with their own power uh, dimensions obscured and invisible. So to create visualizations of global migration is to add new layers of meaning onto a text that is itself often not understood to be political. And as the migration data is overlaid on a map, it simultaneously disrupts and reinforces static notions of the nation. Uh, the data layers, the migrant data, becomes a visual violation of the map of the world. The migrants themselves depicted in forms such as curved lines, dots, or arrows are reduced to pixels, and their visual forms disrupt the map, reinforcing the sense of transgression of national boundaries by migration. This is particularly important because these visualizations risk telling stories that align with anti-migrant rhetoric that positions migrants as threats to national identity, economy, security, and borders, among other factors. These issues are exacerbated in visualizations of asylum seekers and refugees and forced migrants, which raises the critical question of how to represent vulnerable populations in ways that resist dehumanizing them, protects their safety, and avoids positioning them as a problem. And I'll first look at uh, some examples that do this really badly, and then some examples that work with uh, refugee uh, communities to do this um, a lot better. And so one place we can see this is in a map called The Flow Towards Europe, produced by the data visualization firm Lucify. Um, so uh, there's a note accompanying the project which states Europe is experiencing the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. Uh, based on data from the United Nations, we clarify the scale of the crisis. Um, the textual cue here of crisis itself contributes to the sense that migrants are a problem uh, and this, this crisis, this emphasis on crisis is it's, uh, has an othering effect, uh, a reminder that Europe is at the center of the narrative here, those other people who are not from Europe are coming to Europe. Um, and then it's compounded by a linguistic choice to use refugee, which obfuscates the complexities of migration, particularly around um, categorization of migrants. Uh, the data here is actually asylum seeker data and doesn't even include uh, six million Syrian refugees. Uh, they're not in that data set from the UN Refugee Agency that's been used for this project. So, you know, we see this interesting and kind of troubling slippage between migrant categories. We see an erosion of difference, um, as well as uh, an elision of human narratives that would uh, speak to why um, or how people um, became migrants. And the interplay of textual and visual modes is augmented by um, the gestural. The flow towards Europe seeks to demonstrate the magnitude of asylum seeking in a way that would be, in their words, intuitive, memorable, and engaging. Uh, so here, each moving dot corresponds with 25 people. Asylum seekers, uh, as these dots flow across borders as huddled masses of data points, uh, their conversion into data is stripped of personal details uh, that would shed light on the complexities of migration. Uh, and they're really working here, um, driven more by the lure of producing attractive data visualizations than they are in thinking about what it means to ethically represent 
um, uh, asylum seekers. So their decision to group migrants by 25 was a decision made based on the limitations of their platform because if there were more dots, it would be too crowded. Um, that's <laughs> literally what they said. Um, and then there would be performance issues with the visualization. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but then they, they're really interested in, in speed and you can actually um, speed up the visualization um, if you want um, because uh, they themselves are actually determining the speed of the visualization based on this like, very strange calculation that they made. Um, the UN Refugee Agency data is monthly, and so they actually wanted to distribute migrants evenly over time uh, when you don't actually have, uh, so, so they wanted to, to have the flow look unimpeded and regular, because it's pretty, if inaccurate. <laughs> and so they, here's what they did. Wait, they calculated departure dates based on arrival date, distance traveled, and speed. And their decision for speed was average human walking pace. I mean, despite the fact that people get places any number of ways, right? Um, and so the default speed of the visualization, which you can see here, you know, produces a particular perception of migration. Uh, you can speed it up for a heightened sense of the flow and the scale of migration, which also inflames the sense of magnitude and inflames the sense of crisis. Um, and also because they're omitting routes of migration, because people don't get from point A to point B in a straight line, uh, the moving dots um, are incommensurate with the lived reality of migration, and then they emphasize this idea of uniformity and unimpeded waves of migrants just coming to Europe and coming to Europe, and they're never stopping. And that uh, you know feeds and plays right into anti-migrant sentiment. Uh, that's that's particularly been a problem in Europe, um, and and so we have this kind of sense of a, of seamless migration that also um, doesn't account for the fact that you know these are dangerous journeys. Um, their dangerous journeys and, ch and dis decisions that people made, um, that it's better to, to make that journey than to stay where they were. Um, and so in this data, um, we have quantitative data, right? We have numbers, we have geographical locations, marking origin and destination, we have temporal data. If you scroll over a country, you can see some numbers um, and, and some, um, a differentiation by country, um, but we also don't typically uh, have any more data, uh, or any more data given to us in these visualizations, such as like who's an asylum seeker, or um, a refugee, age, gender, reasons for migration, um, sense of whether the migration is political, economic, social, or another reason, uh, and this absence of data that sheds light on the humanity of forced migrants. And that's really in tension to this reduction of human lives to 1 25th of a dot. Uh, the importance of, of humanizing uh, the dead is, ref is reinforced by a move that was made by uh, the German newspaper uh, Der Tagesspiegel in um, 2017, in November 2017, uh, when they published uh, Die Liste, uh, which is not a data visualization in the typical sense, um, but was an intent, attempt to use data to tell stories of migration and account for more than 33,000 people who died while trying to reach um, Europe and uh, since, since 1993. Uh, so the list has been compared to the wartime practice of um, publishing names of, of war dead. Uh, they published this on November 9th to intentionally coincide with Kristallnacht uh, and, the, and the Berlin Wall anniversaries. Uh, and what they try to do, as they say, is represent the dead as human beings with an origin, a past, and a life. Uh, so this list, um, which is in German, uh, but, but talk uh, includes uh, known and recorded migrant deaths, uh, countries, the sources, uh, when they have the information, ages, and circumstances of death. Uh, and so the, as the editors noted, we want to honor them on the one hand and at the same time make it clear that every line tells a story. So we see this dimension um, of human um, stories that we don't get in, in, in these other kinds of data visualizations. So it's a pretty stark contrast. Uh, 
Um, and it's, it's actually kind of disappointing that a lot of the data visualizations that deal with uh, dead migrants fall prey to some of the same challenges as those that are visualizing um, living migrants. So this is um, missing migrants, a uh, visualization that tracks death along migratory routes, which was developed using data sets from the International Organization for Migration, which is a, an inter intergovernmental organization that provides services related to migration uh, to migrants and to countries. Um, and aside from the graphs on the left-hand side that provide quantitative data on migrant death, aggregated data points are represented as circles with numbers of deaths in particular locations. And a closer look at the data uh, provides information on number of dead, a gender, origin of uh, country of origin, cause of death, location, and information reliability when it's available. Um, and because um, the data of, of dead migrants here is, is separated out from data on living migrants, it's actually difficult to understand kind of the relative scope between life or death. Uh, in, in, in the context of migration, which uh, a different project tries to take up. So this is Refugees by Mediterranean Sea, a visualization from the CREATE lab at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, which puts living and dead migrants, uh, data, migrant data in conversation with each other, uh, tracking uh, forced migrants. You know, when you can see some of the same challenges that we already saw in the flow towards Europe, as well in terms of the, the gestural dimensions of the, of the visualization. Uh, so it's enlarging circles here, white for asylum seekers and purple for the dead, emphasizes the dangers of, of the journey. But if you stare at it long enough, what you come to realize that white circles enlarge over time to emphasize the magnitude of migration, but the death, set, the death count resets each month. Uh, so you actually don't get um, a representation of death over time. In the, and also, when you look closely at the data, it's also numerical, and you again don't get at that sense that you get in Delista of you know every every dot tells a story, uh, or that we have that uh, see this sort of the humanity of migrants. Uh, and I want to note, you know, at its heart, the visualizations here uh, are not particularly good or bad. Uh, rather, they're reflective of particular decisions made by their creators, uh, and some of these decisions are conveyed as being conscious ones and some of them aren't, uh, but the choices are integral to how migrants are represented. Um, and they're important precisely because data visualizations are commonly understood as presentations of data and sources of information rather than as arguments. Uh, but as arguments, they are actually of great significance to how audiences interpret migration. Uh, there have been a few um, really interesting projects that are co-constructing visualizations with migrant communities uh, that are, are great alternatives. Um, one is uh, XOD, which is a visualization that was created uh, using testimonies of uh, 2,600 plus migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa to Italy. Uh, and this project features um, an articulation of roots that are absent in other um, visualizations that we've seen. Um, another important example is Crossing the Mediterranean Sea by Boat, uh, which is a project from the University of Warwick uh, based on 200 qualitative interviews with migrants, and it also captures roots. And then also when we look right here at the ways they're describing the, the people whose stories they're telling, we see, you know, we see familial terms like brother, uh, mother, husband, describing uh, the, the, the migrants, um, as well as friends. And, and so um, we also see the political and social uh, reasons of tending their migration. And it would be really easy just to say, you know what, these are qualitative approaches. Those others are quantitative approaches, and that's fundamentally uh, the, different, the difference here. But for me, these this raises an important question, a, ser a series of questions about what it takes uh, to scale humanizing representations of migrant data. So how might data collection from intergovernmental agencies need to be changed to emphasize the humanity of migrants? 
um, in what ways or what concerns with uh, privacy and security and safety and the policing of migratory routes actually make the case for data collection through non-governmental channels that could capture the messy complexities of migration uh, more fully. Uh, could we think about new visualizations that would actually resist this attractive visualization um, phenomenon and instead of these unimpeded waves have these kind of anti-teleological herky-jerky messy visualizations that would actually be more reflective of migration um, or you know what would it mean to use an entirely different map one without territorial borders or dispenses with the world map entirely um, and I, I think we're going to hear about counter some indigenous counter mapping um, from our next speaker as well um, which I look forward to um, so how can we actually think about different approaches that might disrupt, disrupt the ways that users envision mobile populations uh, and reframe uh, migration visualizations so the migrant isn't a problem? And these were actually some of the questions that were on my mind when I began work uh, with the team behind Torn Apart Separados in the summer of 2018. Uh, Torn Apart Separados is a series of data visualizations that we created in response to the US government's um, zero tolerance uh, immigration policy and family separation policy. Uh, and it was created by a temporary coalition of librarians, faculty, um, and graduate students, all of whom are listed on our credits page. And they are, um, so I wanna make sure that they're, they're recognized. Uh, Manan Ahmed, Mara Alvarez, Silvia Fernandez, Alex Hill, Marissa Martinez, uh, Mosir de Zaparera, uh, Linda Rodriguez, who was actually in end-stage terminal uh, cancer when she was working with us on this project and has since passed, unfortunately, um, and, and me as well. All of us uh, were either migrants ourselves or grew up in the borderlands of the United States, and uh, this, the, we were all sort of feeling rather uh, disheartened and troubled by immigration policy I wanted to think about if there's something we could do, just anything we could do. And um, so Torn Apart Separados, uh, sort of in this context of thinking through this larger question of how we map migration, um, has come to be an example for me of how mapping can be used to decenter the migrant as a problem and instead focus attention on the carceral state as the instigator and maintainer of the crisis. So uh, the roots of Torn Apart Separados um, are grounded in a, in a series, that's volume two, in a series of, of research-based decisions uh, that we made starting in late May of 2018. If you remember the news, first of all, we heard about family separation policies. Then we heard about 5,000 lost children lost by the United States government. So when those children were allegedly lost by the US government, Alex Hill and I and some others started doing research trying to think, well, is there something we can do to respond and to intervene? And you know, because we're fundamentally all researchers, uh, we started just trying to understand the situation rather than leaping to the idea that there was a way to mobilize our digital humanity skills to do something. And what we learned was that um, there was a whole system put into place by the US government for managing unaccompanied children who arrive at the border, and that those 5,000 allegedly lost children um, were actually unaccompanied minors. These weren't children separated from families who were then lost. That would happen later, unfortunately. But what we found out was that lost in this uh, sense meant that, um, so unaccompanied minor arrives at the border, Customs and Border, but Customs and Border Patrol take, take custody, give them to ICE, give them to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is a division of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, within 20 days, they have to find uh, either a sponsor or a family member. 90% of these children go to family members, and after 30 days, if somebody calls the house from the Office of Refugee Resettlement and nobody picks up the phone, the child is lost. Now, we were also making contacts and talking with social workers and others uh, working directly with uh, can refugee um, with, with commu asylum seeking communities and, and discovering that a lot of these children and their families did not want to be found because they were undocumented. And so the sort of uh, assumption of the social media outrage cycle, the assumption of, of um, 
the news media, the assumption of us was that we should find the lost children. It was totally wrong and misguided. And so we actually figured this out several days before the news cycle. And so we decided that our only intervention could be to share what we knew and you know combat this outrage. And that's what we could do. That was the best use of our, of our skills. Uh, so a couple weeks later, we started seeing the family separation um, policy um, hitting the news cycle again. We started seeing these horrible images of parents separated from their children. This question again of what could we do came up, and the idea came to be, you know what, let's see what we can learn about immigrant detention. Let's see if we can figure out where children being separated from their families uh, are. And so we set, up, uh, we set up a team of researchers. We worked for a week to create this series of one, two, three, four, five, six, six data visualizations. Uh, we parked two to three days for research to try and find everything we could find. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but large orange uh, circles correspond to uh, facilities used by ICE to detain immigrants. The small orange circles correspond to facilities that are contracted to ICE, but at the time that we were working did not have anybody detained in them. So this is, uh, we're talking about late June um, 2018. And then you can see here are purple circles, which actually correspond to the places that children were being um, held, which we found, uh, we found those through hand curation. Uh, we started looking at who the Office of Refugee Resettlement was giving grants to, and then we started Googling all the places. We found some other gov old government documents documenting uh, transfers from uh, immigrant detention centers to uh, immigration court, and then started cross-referencing them, and that, this was our, our process. Um, everything had at least two sources documenting um, that they were legit, and currently in use, including one governmental source at the minimum. And so we then took all this data and then told a series of abstract data, increasingly more abstract data stories. Uh, and then that was in a week. And then volume two, which was in late August, we, um, it, we released in late August, it took longer. Uh, we data mined and visualized 20,000 um, government contracts given out by ICE to um, fund immigrant detention. Because the question that kept coming up as we were working on volume one was, where's the money? We want to follow the money. So later, we followed the money. Um, and so what these visualizations do differently than some of the examples that I mentioned above is that they don't make migrants into the problem. They turn the gaze of mapping onto the carceral state and to its infrastructures of immigrant detention. Uh, so here uh, in Clinks, which was the first uh, data visualization, uh, which is actually what you're looking at right now, um, we wanted to demonstrate that ICE is everywhere, not just at the border. And it's permeating the landscape, the entire landscape of the United States. Our visualizations get increasingly more abstract uh, as we tried to experiment with genres of data visualization to tell stories about migration. So here is the trap. The trap, um, if you see these little semicircles, these are the ports of entry. Um, where someone should be able to seek, able to seek asylum. But what was happening was that the, uh, in, in June was that the ports of entry were being closed to asylum seekers. Uh, so they were either forced to just wait or they went and crossed the border here in these spaces in between the ports of entry where uh, it is criminalized to cross the border. And then this, we call it the trap. And so this, this orange spot also um, indicates the 100 mile radius of jurisdiction of Customs and Border Patrol. Um, to just uh, ask for someone's papers. Uh, and then we also, I can show you as well, um, particularly in terms of this question of representing vulnerable populations, we created this weird data visualization that you know, we, we, we sort of stopped playing by rules. Well, because we could, because we're humanists and not data journalists. And so what we have here is um, a depiction of, a rough depiction of places, of clusters of children's shelters. And if you try and click on them, they go away. And so in part, this is trying to re uh, represent some of our decision making when we were thinking about how do we uh, deal with this data that we had. We had, as far as we knew, and it was actually true, the most complete list of shelters where children's were, children were being held. We ended up giving it to the Washington Post uh, eventually, because they were like, oh, we want your data. 
everybody wanted our data, including um, Swedish design firms, uh, which we didn't give them our data, for reasons that I think we made clear in the first part of my talk. Uh, so we kept asking ourselves, what do we do with this data? Uh, we wanted to represent it. On the Clinks uh, visualization, the first one you saw, it's, um, everything's mapped at the city and state level. So you could see it, you could see the name of it, but you can't see the address of it. And really, we were concerned that really well-meaning people without experience organizing would show up and invite state violence at a place housing uh, vulnerable children. And so we ended up making this um, data visualization to evoke our experience of, of, of working with that data and also um, the slipperiness and shadiness of ice. Uh, and uh, so our approach here was really to think about a way of visualizing migration that doesn't dehumanize migrants themselves, but instead emphasizes the dehumanization wrought by the state. Um, so this is a different kind of approach than actually mapping migrant data uh, the way the others did, uh, but this has possibilities for disrupting the way that we think about mobile populations and decenters the state as a victim of a crisis and positions it as a creator of a crisis and in turn challenge public discourse around uh, migration. So really what concerns me here, what we were trying to work against with this project is that kind of lost in the drive to visualize because we can, there's often a, a, a reluctance to stop and ask if we should and how we should. Um, and this is uh, not only a matter of, of working with data or the specificities of a particular data set or uh, transforming the lives and stories of human beings into pixels, but all of which are very real concerns. This is also about the repercussions of design choices that are made when working with data that's representing humans. And as I've suggested, these really range from textual to visual to gestural cues that can position migrants as problems. Uh, and this is especially crucial in the context of visualizing uh, migration because of the vulnerable position of those who are refugees, who are asylum seekers and forced migrants, um, whose vulnerability led to their migration in the first place, uh, migration, uh, vulnerability in transit, vulnerability on arrival, uh, and vulnerability in the broader public discourse around uh, migration, particularly in the United States and in Europe, where sentiment uh, towards migrant populations is heavily divided. But by understanding the design choices uh, and their effects on the messages that get conveyed in data visualizations of migration, I argue, we can make important steps uh, towards more fully realizing the possibilities uh, of stories that can be told uh, about migration in ethical ways. Thank you. We have... 10 minutes for questions. If anybody wants to ask some questions, we'll bring the microphone around. Trevor? I wonder if you could speak a little bit, oh, first of all, thank you for the uh, talk. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, flows going both ways? I think that, that map of Europe really masked the complexity of returning home after a crisis or just migration in general? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's absolutely uh, an important point as well because it's often, it's often point A to point B. Um, it looks like, you know, those make it look like everyone who comes there gets there. Everyone who gets from point A to point B doesn't go somewhere else. Um, I think really the key here is, is not you know, not don't make those data visualizations. Make the choices that you're making legible. Create a critical apparatus that discusses the design, design choices, the documents, um, the, the production process, and that also makes legible the potential impact of the decisions made. You know, if let's say you don't, you wanna make a data visualization, you don't have the other data. Make it clear, this is the data you have, this is, these are the affordances of this data, these are the limitations of this data. I mean, I think generally this has been, been uh, my interest in, in digital humanities more broadly is there's not enough attention to what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, and what effects it has. And I mean, ultimately, these are, these are works of scholarship uh, in a, I wouldn't say that the Finnish design firm 
project is a work of scholarship. But you know, a lot of these projects are works of scholarship. And then, it, you know, as such, it's actually incumbent upon us who are doing this work to talk about, you know, what our projects can and can't do. And that's actually something we did extensively with Torn Apart Separados. Uh, we had uh, an essay, we have a whole essay, this is volume two, um, which this, what you're looking at is um, ICE awards given by Congressional District. Um, but what we did extensively in these textures essays that accompanied our project is talk about either kind of leads we had that we thought things were going to pan out into interesting avenues of exploration and they didn't. Um, so there was a part of the team on the project who was working on trying to do a media barometer that would let you kind of take a look and see at any given moment where uh, local media are talking about uh, immigration. And then we, we ran into problems, uh, the team ran into problems with that because it was, the APIs were too expensive and we had no money and we had no time when we were working on this project. We had no institutional support. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think those are the kind of dimensions. I think in the, in the, the need to always, the sort of sense of the need to present uh, perfection and polish, it's easy to overlook the value of talking about the, the avenues um, of failure. I love visualization maps, so thank you for showing the good ones and the bad <laughs> ones. Um, what I was interested in is if you have seen a, a, a map that portrays um, like differences like um, when, mili when, when American military operations are taking place in a country and then we see immigration from that country to the West. You know, things that we have done ourselves to um, create this crisis, you know. So are there maps like that out there and can you recommend some for us? It'd be kind of great to show those. You know, things like, um, you know, where we have caused issues in Latin America, you know, in Nicaragua. So um, I would love to see those kinds of Yeah, no, I examples. haven't actually uh, seen, I haven't seen any myself. Uh, there was an, an article floating around, I feel like it's probably a Slate article, that was actually about how, so maybe seen this, how America hid its own empire. And I, I think that was about mapping. <clears throat> it was about a particular approach to mapping. In, Huh? Yeah, yeah, it was like a week ago. Yeah, I just didn't have time. It was very, actually, I'm sure I could find it. Um, but I, it was, it seemed like it was about how mapping. Because played. these are always, the ones we see in the paper are always about how this is disconnected from anything that we have done ourselves and yes. not connected to any kind of behavior on oh, our part absolutely as a country. Agree. And it'd be nice to see those kinds of um, connections made more clearly in visualizations. Yeah, and I mean, I think actually that's not, that's a, something that it's not the U.S. context, uh, or it's not really specifically a, a context. But I think a project like what they're doing um, here with with um, crossing the Mediterranean Sea by boat kind of gets at that because uh, all it is is one more step to like how were these social conditions created in the places where people are fleeing, and you know when we look at it from the perspective of contemporary history, um, we can see you know, U.S. foreign policy, for example, and war having a huge effect on it as well. Thank you. Why'd you make me walk? I was waiting. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> oh, I, I, it, it kind of did this. So it wasn't. I have a, a question about teaching. Um, how have you used these uh, maps in the past and like uh, in what pedagogical context and how do you, what, is, what has been your experience of students understanding the sort of uh, carceral elements of this problem? This is a great question. It actually, it, I'm teaching a class on the digital Black Atlantic right now. It's mapping week. Actually, well, it's one of two mapping weeks. but. Um, you know, I use these as, I mean, I think I always start with that clip from the West Wing um, of the Gail Peters projection. If you haven't seen this, go to YouTube and watch this. But it's basically an episode of the West Wing, a show I never watched, by the way, um, it, in which there are these people from the um, 
it's like the Coalition for Concerned Cartographers or something like this, that they come and they're showing the people in the White House that you know everything you think about the Mercator projection, projection is wrong. So I start by showing that to my students to first like blow their mind. I usually assign some critical cartography to them and then I have them look specifically at projects and do rhetorical, multimodal rhetorical analyses of the projects and teach them how to do that. And so get them actually engaged in this question of what kinds of assumptions um, can you, will you as a user make coming to this map based on what's presented to you and then in turn what would you do differently to challenge that and so based that's what we did last week and so you know this week they're doing a little more of that and they're also um, kind of blue sky thinking around some mapping projects they could do in terms of the absences of, of african-american history in salem massachusetts where we're located um, so that's how i how I, I deal with some of this in the pedagogical context I just had a question, like on the torn apart. I noticed also because uh, I looked on my phone because I was just kind of far away um, that you had the politicians and how much money they were yes. receiving as the other part, which I think is incredibly helpful um, in many ways. And then I was wondering how sometimes I find with the mapping project, particularly with the with the question of my migration or migrants, um, that and indigenous people being dispossessed and the extraction and being pushed out which has led to the huge migration often get collapsed into this like people are coming from honduras or guatemala yeah. and they get um collapsed into these kind of national nation state identities it, it, do you know of a map that kind of disaggregates those those sorts of issues because sometimes it's the very the, their very state and they get aggregated you know, as indigenous people being pushed out in terms of that, or because there's no water because they changed, they dammed up the rivers or yes. something. You know. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't actually. Uh, there is, there's an interesting um, database that's trying to get people to identify um, people who've died uh, crossing the Mexico-U.S. border. It's actually a kind of a crowdsourcing project. And s yeah, and so, I mean, there is in that, I mean, a, a sort of, a request that you can submit information, including circumstances surrounding, surrounding migration. I mean, I think that's absolutely critical because I would think about that, that case of that there was a young girl um, who they thought was two because they thought she was a Spanish speaker who just wasn't speaking Spanish. And it turns out she was a Quechua speaker. And so she, you know, wasn't speaking Spanish. And she was actually like, twice as old as they thought, you know, she, she wasn't. And so, um, no, I don't actually know of uh, any any projects that are working on that, but I think that 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 death database project, migrant deaths, I think, uh, is called, is is trying to collect some of the the data around that too. I mean, I think probably part of the problem is also the U.S. government a shoddy data collection. Uh, although, like, I'm also torn about this because you know, on the one hand, you know, more data collections, more surveillance, and um, at the same time, though, I think there's um, a value to, to knowing uh, and and to disaggregating uh, some of the data and the presumptions around who comes and why. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.